Thanks, Greg. Um, so yeah, Sam and I are here to talk about Digital Earth Pacific. And uh, we're going to keep it fairly high level, but talk about what the mission is, how we're going to achieve it, and then go through some of the examples that we're presenting next week uh, at the launch of the Digital Earth Pacific. So I'm going to talk about the program, about the technical roadmap that we've just finished and is um, getting formalized, or, or the stamp of approval from the steering committee. And then Sam's going to talk about the, the needs that have been identified and demonstrate the work. So with Digital Earth Pacific, we envision a collaborative ecosystem based on open data principles and analysis-ready, cloud-optimized data. And these are kind of like buzzwords, but like we really mean it. Like organizing data so that it is more easily accessible for the people of the Pacific. Um, the program seeks to empower users through the provision of infrastructure, uh, documentation, training and support, and will deliver through um, aiming to uh, enable access, visualisation and analysis of large-scale data across the whole Pacific. I kind of um, ruined this slide by talking about it before, but really what we want to do is, <laughs> in simple terms, enable people to more easily access and analyse vast quantities of Earth observational data. So we have a three-phase plan. We're in phase one now, which is really building the governance and building the technological infrastructure and starting to get out there and talk about to people about what they need. And then we want to in, um, increase capacity, do capacity development and visit um, all the countries, like we heard Ariki talking about er earlier, um, showing people uh, different ways of working perhaps, but um, um, demonstrating that, that using large amounts of data is is easy if you um, use some modern methods. And then we want to get operational so that we are really getting productive in enabling science on this data and, and getting people to build products that are useful and getting them out into people's hands and continuing to um, empower future generations to be able to um, uh, do this kind of work as well. So this stuff's been talked about for a while. I'm sure there are reports that go earlier than this, but there's um, uh, reports from 2019 uh, 2021, where we started talking about needs assessment for um, our project. Um, a business case that came out last year, um, was a bit delayed due to COVID, of course. And we have this technical roadmap that's just been drafted, which ends up being a bit of a strategy for what we're going to do. In terms of um, background for the roadmap, uh, we want to be user-driven and community-led. So that's talking to people and asking about what they need or what's hard now and how we can enable them to do, thing, do things differently. We want to build a, um, a, a unified data lake so that there is this uh, large amount of data that's, that we produce and it's already available and we document it and we show people how to access it. It's not like a hodgepodge of things all over the place. It's sort of intuitive to, to know where it is and the metadata is next to it, that kind of thing. We want to look at the big picture, so FAIR principles are, are pretty well known, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. It's one of those sort of throwaway things, but it's all really important. We'll integrate with the Group on Earth Observation, so the, the um, UN Committee around Earth Observation. And I think it's important to recognise a fairly, a, a more modern um, principle called CARE, which is around collective benefits authority control, responsibility and ethics, which is around indigenous or Pacific people's uh, ownership of these data products and recognising that there are, there are different ways of, um, of uh, retaining that ownership and um, uh, rather than just um, pure open data licences, which is a more sort of Western way of approaching it. I'm quite passionate about doing projects that are around open source software and contributing in meaningful ways to those open source software projects. Uh, open data, of course, means that people have clear, clearly defined rights about the use of the data products that we produce. And uh, we're going to do it agile, which is one of those catchphrases, of course, but we're using nice cloud native tech, uh, which helps us to move fast. <coughs> I do have a bit of a bit of a, um, I guess, uh, some ideas rolling my round, around in my mind around whether that's fit for purpose, whether using things like Kubernetes and, and like CICD based on um, GitOps and these kind of fancy cool things, if that's a step too far, maybe it should be less complicated than that, but I love working with these things and I'm going to see if we can make it work for people. 
So I want to empower people in the Pacific to be owning this platform and these tools and this work, so make sure that it's right. So I worked on Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa in the past, and I did this sketch for Digital Earth Africa, and I keep throwing it around because I really like um, the simplicity of it, really. I, I realise I can't shine the laser on both screens, but, you know, here and here. So we start with the, the base layer, which is data, um, and analysis-ready data, and that means, really, for Earth observation, Landsat and Sentinel-2. Landsat has the depth of time, but it's a bit lower resolution. Sentinel-2 has a uh, five-day revisit and global coverage at 10 metres, and it's like incredibly valuable, but doesn't have that depth of time. So those two optical products are really core. And then Sentinel-1 is uh, a SAR, or radar data, which sees through clouds, which is handy when it's um, pouring and it's flooding and you want to see the water extent, but you can't with optical. So they're kind of the core uh, data products, and then we build uh, derived products on top of that. So things like um, land use land cover or um, water classifier to look at surface water, or we're working on coastlines, historic coastlines, so looking at Landsat all the way back to the 80s and having a look at how the coastline has either eroded or accreted over this time. So these kind of things. So that's the data, that's the data store, and people should be able to directly access this data without having to use our opinionated APIs or services or maps. The data should be there for people to use. But on top of that, we have those opinionated services, so um, WMS, WMPS, um, uh, with Stack API, um, a um, Jupyter um, data science environment, these kind of tools that, that we want to use, that we think people want to use, and so you can come through that angle. And you have the different sort of user stories where there's um, maybe a decision maker, the boss guy doesn't know how to write some Python, so you give them the simple web map to explore, or the, the people that want to actually get stuff done, like the data science we just heard before, and they can um, copy and paste some examples of Python to, um, to start getting productive. So in terms of a technology vision, we want to encourage the development of a culture of a collaboration and support. And this sort of feeds into what I was talking about yesterday, about how I learned from other people. I want to teach other people. So if we can empower people to, to work in these ways, to, to get, to, to get <laughs> I want to say leverage, but I hate that word, to leverage the Earth observation data and really get productive with it, um, to save them downloading one scene at a time and instead being able to use like a thousand scenes over a whole year and, and do some, some big processes. We want to participate in the global open earth observation community as well, so stand on the shoulders of others but also communicate how we're working and, and collaborate there. Open source, open data, cloud native as I said, analysis ready, cloud optimized, all of these little buzzwords that if you open them up and have a look at them, they're, they're really great values I think. But as I said, really importantly, um, looking at that community of practice around science that supports people to solve the problems that they already have, that they're already trying to solve, and, and to do them in common ways and collaborate with us and with, with others across the Pacific. So at least three technology goals, real pithy, short, about empowering people across the Pacific to access and analyze data. So that's getting data into the hands of people. Simplifying access to Earth and ocean observation data. So that's about building infrastructure and documentation and tooling. And then to deliver new products. So look at what people need and um, do the work and, and do the science where we can build um, reliable, trusted products that actually solve some of these problems. And all of this stuff working together. So that's, that's the vision, that's the strategy. And um, we're starting now. We've got a few products that are being launched and I'm gonna hand over to Sam here to talk about this. Mm. She's about to say it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my name is Samantha Kraftik. I work at SPC um, in the geoinformatics team. Just, I mean, I think everyone will know from the presentation in the morning what SPC is and what we do, but just to be clear, it's not the brand of canned peaches. <laughs> um, but the team of geoinformatics is the one that's been implementing or working on um, Digital Earth Pacific from SPC uh, internally. Um, the team that I only joined this team three months ago, so I'm quite new to this. I'm not really presenting my work here. I'm doing it in the name of the team. Uh, they're busy with preparing the launch next week, as Alex said. Um, am I on the right track? Um, okay, so. Um, here we go. 
Um, as Alex said, uh, did you say actually? We were meant to say. We did a series of um, needs assessment workshops early um, in the sort of start of Visit Border Pacific um, to get a bit of an idea of what is actually needed from the countries in terms of earth observation um, or like a platform such as Visit Border Pacific. These were conducted, of course, during Corona, so there was a full range of um, types of workshops being run. But I think the more important thing is that it was run with a variety of countries. I mean, a, a sample of four countries from all the 22 member states, but representing a variety of geographies, and so hopefully also covering a variety of needs and challenges that they're facing and what they would want to use Earth observation data for. Um, so from these workshops came out course a report, but also sort of the um, you know, reinforcement of the need for, or the utility of Earth observation data for the work that they're doing or want to do, which is monitoring and tracking challenges from climate change, food insecurity, and disaster risk. As you've heard today, I think several times and over the week, getting sort of regular field data in the Pacific Islands is quite a challenge. And so the use of Earth observation data, is, of course, can offer a lot of um, yeah, benefits. Um, so again, I'm sorry, I'll be repeating quite a lot of what Alex said, but hopefully they're you know, just reinforcement, learning from reinforcement. <laughs> um, there was, what came out of these workshops was also the need for easier access to Earth observation data, because right now, if anyone has worked with Earth observation data, it is quite a process to get to it. Um, even if it is uh, freely and publicly available, like Sentinel and Landsat, it's still work. Uh, it takes time, it takes skills, um, which could be spent on something better. And we heard a, in a presentation yesterday that we want to abstract that from users so they can focus on actually getting sort of like the, yeah, the value from that data. Um, and not only that, but you know, once you have the data, you want to actually get the information out of the data, so there's a need for um, building capacity or developing capacity, increasing capacity for um, being able, the countries being able to apply those um, EO products to national development priorities and their sustainable development goals. Wrong button. Um, what was also done during those workshops was sort of ranking and prioritizing um, a bunch of different sort of use cases and application areas. Um, these range from coastline change detection, land cover change detection, but also things like neotropic bimetry, fishing vessel tracking, so sort of quite a range of issues. Um, as you can see, they were sort of prioritized based on how many countries found them relevant. But um, I think what's nice to see is that quite a lot of them are you know, broadly relevant. So I think it kind of shows that despite the diversity, there is also, there are sort of common challenges and yeah, digital earth pacific could really be useful across all member states. Um, from that list, as Alex said, we have been sort of working on, or the team has been working, I shouldn't take credit, um, on several products for the initial launch. Um, what I'd want to highlight here is, well, one, there, we've been working on the regional scale products, so ones where from that list that you saw before, I don't know how to go back, um, I won't try. Um, they're the ones that would be applicable to a wide range of countries, but also that could be developed without sort of the need for specialized country data, field data. Um, so the algorithm that we use to develop them, yeah, can be applied to the whole region and we can generate this product without having every country have to go through the process themselves again. Um, so that's how we're supporting that. Um, additionally, they are, um, alpha version products because we haven't had the time to validate them yet before the launch, but they were also selected because we're building on what was done for the other digital earth programs, digital earth Australia and Africa, where these products were developed and those me um, the methodologies for those programs was actually validated and published. Um, so we're quite confident in the results um, for the launch um, and it was also a faster process to develop them despite the challenges of the Pacific. Um, right, okay, so now I'm just gonna show some of the, these products, some images, um, make it a bit more visually interesting. Um, so the Coastlines product is a product which um, uses Landsat data, so it's a 
we have coastline since 2000 up until uh, 2022. Um, with the 30 meter resolution, we're extracting the coastlines. It's actually the water line, um, mean annual water line. So for each year we have uh, a, yeah, the water line extracted as a, um, yeah. But so you can see on the right image, I, yeah, I also won't be <laughs> indicating. Um, you can see the sort of shifting coastline. The darker lines are the past year, so starting from the year 2000, and the more yellow lines are more recent years, so you can really see how the coastline has been changing. But also in the big image on the left, it's just to show sort of, again, the scale of the Pacific and the challenge of mapping all the coastlines for so many different islands, um, which in my understanding from the team was quite uh, different to doing it for a digital earth Africa or Australia, where you have this like one big landmass. Um, here it's, it's, yeah, it's a different set of challenges working with many small islands and atolls. Um, just some more pictures uh, to show that, yeah, with these coastlines, you can see not only the erosion of the coast, um, so on the left, this is, oh, and these are some small islands off Isabel Island in the Solomon Islands, where you can see the um, sort of the islands are shrinking slowly over time and also like shifting their position. But um, you can also monitor, of course, uh, accretion, uh, which could be due to sort of like natural sediment deposition, but also in this case of the image on the right, which is from Funafuti in Tuvalu, you can see like the deliberate land reclamation activities which are there also to sort of um, help with their coastline protection. Um, this is not a product we have at the moment, but a, a, a goal um, in the future to also be able to quantify the rate of change of the coastlines. Um, so one, I mean, then you can actually like talk a bit more in terms of if you, can, if you can quantify it, you can say more about how dramatic the changes are, but also um, see uh, from a distance a bit more whether the um, coast is eroding or growing. Um, so here the red is the erosion and the white is stable and blue is um, a growing coastline. Um, the next one is mangrove extent. We call it mangrove extent, but it's actually what we're doing is using data from the Global Mangrove Watch and using that as a baseline, and then for each year looking within that extent at what could still be classified as mangrove and what is not mangroves anymore. So you can see change um, like that. And then we're also looking at um, classifying it based on the canopy density into um, dense canopies and uh, open canopy. So that gives a bit of an indication on the sort of I guess a, a bit more indication of the change happening to the mangroves if it's a progressive deterioration or um, yeah, the other way around. Um, these images are from Viti Level Bay in Fiji. Um, there was a cyclone in uh, Cyclone Winstone in 2016 that passed through the area, and I, yeah, I don't think you can see it too well <laughs> on these screens, but um, on the left. There are a lot of areas which are colored light green, which is the open canopy, and also gray, which is no mangroves. Um, so from there, it looks like there was quite a lot of damage done by the cyclone to the mangroves. And then over time, so we have, I put a photo from 2019, it's kind of uh, restoring itself with more uh, closed mangroves coming in. Um, so the density is coming back. Um, and then the final product we've been working on is the water observations from space. <coughs> this is a product that um, looks at how frequently water was identified in a pixel um, over the year. So it's again an annual product where every year you can see how often water was identified. Um, so it gives a bit of an idea for water <coughs> monitoring um, availability, sort of looking at the relation between different factors affecting that. These are images from Papua New Guinea. On the left again, this in 2016, 15, 16, there was a massive drought that affected Papua New Guinea. Um, and so you can see that um, this river, which is the Aramia River, was quite severely affected um, with water being less frequently 
uh, identify, but in 2022 you have uh, a lot more water back. I, I should have also said the darker colors are more frequent water detection, the lighter colors are less frequent. No color is no water. Um, so those were the three products, but of course we want people to be able to access them and see them and uh, explore them. And for that we're using Teria. Uh, so thank you, Teria. Uh, this is just a visualization of those three products and BP Little Bay, and you can see it nicely in 3D, so it gives a bit of a different interpretation of the data, or you can relate to it better. Um, and then finally, going back to the needs assessment, there was I talked about the need for access to EO data, um, and then also sort of the, um, increasing capacity for the use of EO data. So of course these products are a bit that, so that the countries don't have to go and create these products themselves, but can immediately go into like extracting information. Um, but we also, as Alex said, we want to run more workshops and engagements, but the, we already did one earlier this year in Tonga, um, which was focused on updating the national land cover map and detecting change. And the participants, um, well, first went out to first sort of identified what kind of classes uh, they would be interested in because they were coming from nine ministries, so they had different needs. Um, then they went out into the field and collected a whole bunch of points. I think it was something like 3,000 3, or something incredible. Um, and then based on that, they came back in and were trained uh, a bit in Python and using the Jupyter Notebook environment in the analytics hub of the Little Earth Pacific. Um, and from there, they created these land cover maps. Um, and then again, from my understanding, I unfortunately wasn't there, it was a really successful workshop. People did find it very useful and there has been a community built around that workshop that is still involved and engaged in collecting points and updating the maps. Um, so that was, I think, a very big boost to the team <laughs> and a sort of like validation that yes, indeed, the need assessment workshops identified actual needs that we're now working to, to yeah, help out with. Um, that's it for me and Alex will close off. Are we on time? Um, so that's that's pretty much it. But um, what's next is we are launching next week at the um, CRGA meeting um, in Noumea. Uh, we want to deliver a product roadmap that really outlines, um, I guess, a, um, a hierarchy of products that feed off each other and, and um, line that up and set it up, do the science. We want to deliver a capacity de development strategy to inform how we go and work with these workshops in, in the island. And um, really we want people to start using the platform every day and being productive on it. So if you have a need to do some of this kind of data science, we've got, um, we've got compute capacity, we've got data, we can um, show you how to use it. So um, yeah, I'm excited to get it going and get people on there. Uh, finally, thank you. We're a um, small team, all working part-time, but we're um, aiming to do some big things and ramping up. So anyway, thanks for listening. <laughs> Over here. Uh, thank you for the awesome talk. Uh, I was lucky enough to actually be with Sachin and the team in Tonga this oh, year for fantastic. the land use land cover, and it was an incredible, incredible week. Um, so also lucky enough to see some of the things under the hood there. Um, it may be controversial to ask, but recently I've heard mention of the potential for a digital earth Aotearoa. And just wondering if that's anything you can elaborate on there. Well, it's great that it starts with an A because they kind of all need to. We've got Digital Earth <laughs> Australia, Antarctica, <laughs> um, Africa, Aotearoa. I don't know what we can use for Pacific, but uh, it's a bit of a shame. Um, I don't know about Digital Earth uh, Aotearoa, sorry. I don't know oh. if you've heard anything. from a, a collective of ministries that look after the funding for the national data here. 
Um, but I guess it's true there's also interest with Orbica and the data cube and us mm. at Lanka Research yep. with the same technology and I just think it's uh, um, there's huge potential for us to work together there to yeah. Yeah, do awesome things. So. Yep. I think the, um, the sort of Digital Earth brand has is, is got some really good credibility and it's taking off around the place. There was a group uh, that run the Swiss Data Cube, Greg Giuliani and, and others, and they've changed it from being called the Swiss Data Cube to the Digital Earth of Switzerland. <laughs> um, there's some people doing it in South America, in North America, there's, there's a lot of this stuff happening. And it's great that we can share, we stand on each other's shoulders, work in open source and, and um, yeah. Really cool. No, great work. Thank you. Any more questions? Hey guys, great presentation. Thanks. I just wanted to know if the team used the Jupyter notebook environment to calculate the products in any way. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that one. Never mind. <laughs> I use Jupyter notebooks all the time, and so when we when my laptop starts not having enough memory. Start running on the Jupyter Notebook server. Um, we have a 32 gig notebook server. We can go up to 256 and 500 gig servers. So we can do some really big products on there. And so the ideal workflow, um, once we get really humming, is that the science can be done um, iterative, iteratively in a notebook, uh, create a pull request, merge that in and build a Docker image. We get that and we use Argo workflows to run these things. You can run that on a couple of tiles on a, on a country have a look at that. If that works well, run it over the whole Pacific. If that doesn't work well, come back to the notebook, fix some bugs. And that cycle can be pretty, pretty quick and do some really big data workflows. It's, um, it's, it's really powerful. Sweet, that's such a good setup. <laughs> um, hello. Uh, so my question is, uh, more of like I see that there are products that uh, that could be used actually for the community. Like I think it's very nice to see that the location of rivers. Uh, but in OpenStreetMap, if it's the, if your imagery is not updated, your river is actually not updated. And I see that there is a potential to produce like um, very very important humanitarian life saving information. Uh, are you looking at uh, possibly maybe putting out some products that are, are maybe data coming out from uh, Earth observation that could be used by the community to update OpenStreetMaps? I guess the problem with these kind of big reference Earth observation programs is the high resolution data is still only 10 meter resolution. And so for OpenStreetMap, um, Carol's got something to say? Yes. Okay. So, so I think for digitizing into OpenStreetMap, if you're wanting, if you're looking at maybe uh, the macro scale, looking at coastlines or um, land boundaries, reefs, maybe, well, maybe not even reefs. I don't know. So, if you can see something at that resolution, then sure. Um, so, one of the products we're working on, probably in the next line, is um, like cloud-free cloud uh, mosaics. And so, looking at, so, so I mean, those, those products should be useful for that. I think. And also, just to add to that, all the products will be. What we've been work, what we've been working on, will be publicly available yep. for use if anyone would want to take take on updating or something like that. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, so my question is, there was the Common Sensing project that was launched in the Pacific. They were working on three Pacific Island countries, and one of the products they were going to deliver was a Common Sensing data cube. Um, I want to know if there's, if you guys are thinking about how you're going to sustain this Digital Earth Pacific platform and um, who's funding it actually. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're working on seeking funding. We have some small um, sources of funding. The, uh, the New Zealand, there's a New Zealand government grant, uh, part of which is going towards Digital Earth Pacific now. But we're in talks with, um, bigger buckets. <laughs> um, in terms of ongoing sustainability, I think it is really important and I absolutely agree with you. And I, and I would hate to think that we throw something over the fence and it dies and there's nobody using it. It's not useful to anybody. So that's, that's where I'd really love to get. 
So this is this is me as a as a person and not as an SBC representative. I would love to get the SBC internal folks who want to do earth observation and remote sensing work hooked on this platform because then if it's useful to them, it's got um, a clear need there, and then that'll give it uh, some impetus for ongoing funding. Maybe that's a naive take, but I really hope to build something useful so that people like complain if it stops working. And from what I understood, there's also been a bit of a chicken and the egg situation with the funding, where you know we need the funding to get going, but then we also the funders would also like to sort of see the utility of it and see it being used to to give the funding. So hopefully, with we're slowly getting there, and we can start looking into getting more of the funding to get this really going. Can I, sorry, well, maybe one, maybe uh, for Sam, this question. So you, sh I think you showed something with the coastline, like the future, yeah. future coastlines, yeah. that sort of thing. So I was kind of wondering, uh, are there like other sort of future projection type data sets that would be on digital Earth Pacific? Because that would be like quite important, I guess, for like planning and. Yeah, do you yeah. mean like as how will the coastline change in yeah. the future? Not just like how, I guess, yeah, coastlines are like one of them, but like yeah. other, maybe like climate, weather type things, because um, a lot of the stuff from like other digital earths, there's been like past historical data or like current data, yeah. but what about like future sort of projection type data? Would that be part? I, no. I could, I imagine it could be if that was sort of like, something that was identified as, as a need, um, for sure it could be added in. Um, we haven't focused on that at the moment, but within SPC as well, there's a lot of modeling work going on, so I'm sure we could, it wouldn't be an issue to, or maybe it would be a bit of a political issue sometimes, but we could look into adding that data in and making that available as well, I think, yeah. And I'm aware of some work uh, from the University of Aberystwyth in Wales, and they work with Digital Earth Australia, and they do some forecasting. So they say, you know, here's the land cover, but if we want to, um, what they call it, uh, revegetate or rehabilitate or rewilding, you know, so they look at different how uh, they can influence future land cover and, and make changes. So there, there are people doing it, um, and it's certainly something that we should be looking at, I think. Mm. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.